Thanks for joining the potluck today. The idea behind the potluck dinner is everybody make a plant-based meal at home and then join this Facebook Live and we all learn about healthy living together. If you're able to make a plant-based meal today or earlier, share with us in the comments what you made. We also have another group called Ted's Potluck Group on Facebook where we share recipes and ideas and support each other eating plant-based. When people ask me why I don't eat animal products anymore, I explain to them I'm trying to avoid our nation's top two killers, heart disease and cancer. I know we're all gonna die, that's not optional, but if we can avoid the top two killers, we're most likely gonna have a longer, more mobile life. And a nice side benefit is no animals have to die in order for us to eat. I heard a life-changing talk one day by a doctor that said, our number one killer in this country is heart disease. What's the major cause of heart disease? Arterial sclerosis. What's the major cause of arterial sclerosis? The filling up of our arteries with plaques and saturated fat and there's no cholesterol in plants. So to reverse or prevent heart disease, all we have to do is stop eating animal products because they have animal proteins and saturated fat in them. Here's a video that I made to point this out. What stands out to you in this graph? You'll notice that there's an arrow at 1940 when Germany occupies Norway. But what does that have to do with the heart attack rates in Norway? So you'll notice from 1927 to 1940, a steady rise in heart attacks. And then all of a sudden a steep drop off in 1940. What happened when Germany occupied Norway? Well, they took all of Norway's animals for the war effort. And look what happened to their heart attack rates. When, when was Norway liberated? 1945. Then they got animals back and look at their rates of heart disease. We have known for a long time that animal saturated fats cause some forms of heart disease and cancers. Plant-based eaters are 80% less likely to get prostate, breast, bladder, and colon cancer. Why are we still eating animal products? I have seen so many benefits in my health from not eating animal products. That is the reason I host these potluck dinners first Wednesday of each month. I want to shout from the rooftops, you can change the trajectory of your health by simply stop eating animal products. We're going to hear shortly from a world-renowned food scientist, Dr. Colin T. Campbell, and he's going to explain how animal products can promote cancer. First, I'm going to show you a video that I made to bring awareness to this problem. It's only one minute long. Really? A hot dog, deep fried french fries, and a soda for lunch? Yeah, I love hot dogs. Well, your body doesn't like hot dogs or any other meat. Why? Here's your digestive tract, 30 feet long. Here's the digestive tract of a carnivore, 5 feet long. So our digestive tract is longer, so what? Carnivores have stronger stomach acid. The meat goes in, gets broken down, and out. Hmm, that's interesting, but what's the big deal? Our longer digestive tract is not meant for eating meat. Our stomach acids are not strong enough to break it down. So, so the meat putrefies in our gut and causes all kinds of diseases, sickness, and cancer. Why not eat this instead? Spaghetti sauce poured over spaghetti squash and baked then mashed sweet potatoes. Much better choice, all plant-based, very filling and very few calories. That's delicious. Dr. Campbell is the author of the China study, Startling Implications for Diet, Weight Loss, and Long-Term Health. His principal scientific interest, which begins with his graduate training in the late 1950s, has been on the effect of nutritional status 
on long-term health, particularly on the causation of cancer. Thank you very much for that very kind uh, introduction. I want to thank Dr. Mark Schultz and uh, Jim O'Hara and Amy Green for inviting me to this very prestigious conference. It's, it's indeed a pleasure to talk to a conference like this, uh, a medically oriented conference uh, about this topic, about nutrition. Uh, I spent many, many years, uh, more than 50 I guess now, counting all together, working in this field with many students and colleagues, mostly at Cornell University, uh, doing this work. And much of my work in the beginning and throughout my career had to do with trying to understand really what cancer is all about, all the way from the cellular level through the, the whole body level. But along the way, uh, nutrition became very interesting, and uh, I learned a lot of things that uh, I didn't expect to learn. Uh, in fact, my views these days are rather different than what they were when I was a student. Uh, in fact, quite dramatically different. But in any case, um, I want to get into the pre presentation. It's hard to talk about a subject like this, as complex as it is, um, quite frankly, in just the minutes we have. Uh, so all I can do, really, is to kind of go through a hop, skip, and jump through some of these significant observations that, in fact, I and my, my students uh, worked on over the years of my colleagues. So let's start off then and, and, and first to mention, incidentally, that the message I want to tell you is not specifically just for prostate cancer. It's a message that has a much broader and diverse effect on cancers of all kinds, diseases of all kinds, I should say. Um, and um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a generalized view, but, it, but it's, it's a view that actually applies, I would, I would argue, to prostate cancer as well as to other cancers too. Um, let, let me start here with this first, uh, this first slide and show you the kind of model that we tended to work with in science uh, to describe the various stages of cancer. What you can see here going from the color coded green to the, on the left to the red uh, is sort of the cancer progression process. Cancer, as you may know, takes a long, long time from the time for the first seeds on through the, the, um, to the development of the uh, clinical uh, diagnosis, essentially. And it's divided oftentimes into initiation, promotion, and progression. Initiation really has to do with the genetic seeds, if you will. Promotion has to do with the long period of time over years when in fact these early seeds, these early cancer seeds are beginning to grow and coalesce and develop into what we call tumors. And eventually uh, we get diagnosed and of course then uh, the things begin to change too. But, but it's a continuum. I want to emphasize this idea, it's a continuum. And the research I'm going to describe that convinced me of a very different view is largely concerned with promotion. And during promotion, during this time, it takes years, decades, if you will, whereas initiation, in contrast, that's just the time it takes for, let's say, for us to get our genes impacted by a chemical or, or something like that. Uh, that occurs uh, all the time, most of our lifetime, to some extent, sort of creating these infant cancer cells. Nutrition is this long period of time, and that's the period of time that I really want to talk about insofar as our own research is concerned. Now, without getting into the details of why I got involved in this particular line of research, um, I just want to show you some results. These are results having to do with experimental animals. And uh, I learned early on, actually when I was working in the Philippines, uh, sort of survey or, or, or coordinating a nationwide program of feeding malnourished children, uh, that uh, protein, it seemed, uh, played a role in cancer development. And it was on that basis, without getting, as I say, into all the details, it was on that basis that I came home and we organized a, a rather major research project that continued for the next about 30 years, uh, funded mostly by the National Institutes of Health and also by the American Cancer Society, that led to this, this series of results that I'm going to describe here. And this one was just touch on just a couple highlights. I could show hundreds of slides to illustrate this point, but I think these, these next two or three slides might do the trick. Basically, the cancer that we were looking at in this particular case as a model to understand cancer was liver cancer in rats, to be specific. And so we were interested in the, the effect of protein on the development of this cancer over the development of that cancer. This slide here basically shows that over the early stages of that development, first 12 weeks, if we fed diets that contained the good levels of protein, 
the recommended levels of protein, which incidentally is 20% of total calories, as opposed to feed and diets 5%, which is considered not to be enough. Quite frankly, it is enough when they get to be adults. But in any case, feeding the regular levels, the good levels, as you can see, the, the cancers, once formed, started to grow over that first 12 weeks, and quite a dramatic difference. This coincided, in fact, with an observation that was made by some Indian workers prior to that that really got me into this. But then the next uh, series of studies, illustrated here in one slide, really turned out to be quite provocative. Namely, if we started feeding animals the first three weeks, for example, 20% protein, the good levels, the recommended levels, if you will, and then switched them to 5%, we turned the cancer off. If we then returned and fed them the 20% protein diet, we turned it on. So we got to a point in time when we could actually turn on and turn off cancer development. Admittedly, it was the early stages. So it begs some questions of whether or not this really applied to, let's say, full-blown tumors. But in any case, this is the early stages, first 12 weeks. And it was the period during promotion. Now, the promotion period, as I say, that's the period, of, I'll return to that, that's the period during which the, the, the nutrition, acting as a fertilizer, if you will, of growing these cancer seeds, that's the period of time that's really critical in this whole process. But it turned out we were feeding 20% and 5%, but I wanted to know something about, what about the intermediate levels? Going, let's say, from 4% up to 20%. Protein is an essential nutrient, and I'm sure that you all appreciate that. We need protein. The question I'm really referring to here is what happens when we consume protein in excess of our needs? And so this is illustrated here in these experimental animal studies. Namely, up to 10% protein. That's about the amount they need. They don't actually even need that. But they need about that at least, uh, for, or, or that, that's plenty for them to uh, do all the good things that protein does. And it's when they start consuming diets in excess of 10%, we can see the mischief starting to, to develop. And that concept of, of, of threshold is, is common to nutrient action. There's oftentimes nutrient thresholds. The nutrients are good things. They do good things for us. But when we exceed the threshold, we see the level that, you know, beyond that, that's where we get into mischief. And that threshold concept, is, as I say, is... Is, uh, is very important in context of what I'm going to tell you here. Now, what I just quickly described was what happens in the early stages of cancer development. Here's a study where we followed cancer development during the entire lifetime of these animals. A lifetime in the case of a rat is about two years, about 100 weeks. And so what we did there, we just fed 5%, 20%. We actually did more than that. This is just as a, a, a sample of some of the data out of a very large study. But we fed 5% or 20% diets for the entire 100 weeks. And if you look over on the right-hand side, you'll see the degree of cancer formation. We call it tumor severity, which takes into consideration the numbers of tumors as well as the growth rate size of the tumors. And you can see a huge difference, a huge difference. Feeding the good levels of protein really turned on that cancer big time. And this coincided, in fact, what the early workers in India had done coincide with what I thought I saw in the children in the Philippines as well. 5% not. The really interesting part of their study, if you can see there in the, sort of the second column area on the left, is that the 20% animals all died, were all dead at the end of their lifetime of liver cancer. These animals had been exposed to a carcinogen that caused liver cancer, but they're all dead. The animals given to 5% allegedly not enough to support good health. They're all alive and thrifty. Their hair coats were sleek, they were hopping in a cage, they were energetic, all the rest and no cancer. It was dramatic. It was dramatic. And we actually looked at this in many different ways. The protein we were using was casein. Casein is the main protein of cow's milk. Soy protein, wheat protein didn't do that, even when it was fed at 20% of calories. So there's a dramatic difference between casein and these plant-based proteins. I found this to be provocative, and that's an understatement, because I'm I was raised on a dairy farm milk and cows, and we milked cows and we drank milk and I drank generous quantities of milk because in those days, to the extent that I even knew anything about nutrition, it was largely because of the protein content in the cow's milk that we thought we were doing the right thing. I actually went away to school, then to Cornell University, did my doctoral dissertation on trying to figure out how to grow animal-based protein, cow's protein, if you will, more effectively so we could consume more of it. So that was the early part of my my career, this was a shock, and it took me a while to get over it, 
but we had to get over it, move on. It turns out that casein had this effect. What was suggested here, too, was that casein is an animal protein, these others are plant proteins, so I thought maybe what's emerging here, a dichotomy between what plant proteins do and what animal proteins can do. And without giving you all the details of that, I want to share with you my, my confidence in the idea, yes, there is a major distinction between animal protein and plant protein in terms of what they can do, and not just for cancer. So, let's stop here quickly for some main points. Namely, a low protein a dietary protein, something like 5% of that, decreases both initiation and promotion, but its effects on promotion are primary. That's important, incidentally, because we knew, or at least I thought I knew in those days, that during the promotion stage, cancer is reversible. And that's what we basically demonstrated. So the fact that, that, that it operates during that period was an interesting. So the nutrient activity during promotion strongly indicates that cancer development can be controlled, perhaps even reversed, by nutritional means. That's an exciting concept. That's an exciting concept, especially when you consider it in the context of the levels of nutrient being consumed in this case, not heroic, you know, excessive, unreal levels. These are levels well within the range of which we all experience, quite frankly. So we look for how does this work. In science, we like to learn how it works. And a lot of people tend to think it's fundamental to Western nutrition, fundamental to Western science. We want to know how something works. We want to know what the so-called explanatory mechanism is. Because if we know that, then we can do things like maybe develop some drugs and this and that and sort of intercept that right reaction. Well, this was, again, another very provocative idea. It turns out there is no such thing as a, as a single explanatory mechanism. There's a whole bunch of stuff all working, hundreds of thousands maybe, of reactions interacting. It's a very complex system. We started looking for mechanisms, in fact, during the initiation stage and during the promotion stage, as you can see there. And every time we look for a mechanism, we found one. Which, you know, that turns on a light bulb too. You know, because it's not, a, it's not a single mechanism, so we can't stop this by stopping a single mechanism, essentially. It's, it's the whole thing sort of operated together, and that, that principle held true for many other work, much other work we did. We didn't incidentally do just protein in this concept, because once we got in, involved in this, and I, I started realizing that, gosh, nutrition is, is really important. Why don't we look at some other cancer systems too, like pancreatic cancer, and and some other nutrients like carotenoids and fat and breast cancer, mammary cancer, and things like that. And as we got into these kinds of studies, we could see this dichotomy only getting reinforced, this dichotomy of animal-based nutrients as opposed to plant-based nutrients. Animal-based nutrients went that way. Plant proteins based went that way. And it was major. It was a major distinction. And so for cancer prevention, a diet that has less fat, less animal protein, more plant protein, more carotenoids, essentially is the kind of diet that prevents cancer and reverses cancer, if we can go that far to say that kind of thing. And so let's return to this scheme that I showed you in the beginning. And you can see there, I've elaborated a little bit, the promotion that shows it reversible. That's clear, it's reversible, whatever stage. Plant-based plant foods push it to the left, animal-based foods push it to the right. Again, coming from the farm, or I remind you, I'm coming from the farm. We did our own slaughter of animals, I did, we milked our cows, we did all the rest, ate our eggs. Uh, that's, this is troubling. The question here in this slide is, well, okay, if it's reversible during promotion, what about during the later stages when people already have cancer? I wanted to speculate that it would operate there too, and I'm convinced it does. We just tend to ignore it. Much of the researchers tend to ignore it or not even study it at all. But basically, the same kind of conditions that operate during promotion prior to the actual diagnosis of the disease are the same kind of forces and mechanisms that are operating after diagnosis, too. I know I'm going out on a limb a little bit on some of this kind of thing, but I'm really convinced that's a very exciting area of future research, and we have a lot of evidence now to support that point of view. In any case, so that's what it works, how it works with cancer. And then wanted to raise some questions. Well, what about some of these other diseases? So um, actually, I got involved about three or four years ago with my youngest son, who's now in medical school, to write a book called The China Study, where as we put this story together, as I started writing this down and tried to understand what in the world it was that I thought I knew, we wanted to go back and look and see if this was consistent with some of the other kinds of diseases, too, that troubled us. And it turns out, here's a list of a bunch of diseases, not a complete list, 
for which there is published peer-reviewed research, really substantial stuff that goes back a long time, much of which has been ignored by the medical community, I must tell you, and by my, research, my own research community. But in any case, the same plant-based diet comprised of whole foods is known to prevent, to suspend, and or cure all of these diseases, some of which are very serious, as you know, some of which are perhaps just problematic and troublesome. But in any case, that's quite a list. And I could spend here hours talking about some of the research that's been done. It, it turns out that this idea of consuming plant-based diets to prevent cancer, reverse cancer, is the same kind of diet that actually restores health and prevents disease of all kinds. It's just, it's the, de it's the very definition almost of health. At the same time, it also promotes superior physical fitness, believe it or not. I've been working with some world-class athletes who have gotten into this and are finding, in fact, they are the ones that tend to get out in front of the others when they do it the right way as far as performance is concerned. Uh, it's a very, very exciting area. I think uh, athletes have, unfortunately, the elite athletes have gone too far into the high protein, high fat, low fiber kind of diet to do their various and sundry things and they need not do so. Okay, so I'm talking about something that's holism. I call it holism. That word in the dictionary is usually spelled H-O-L-I-S-M. I don't like it spelled that way. That's my spelling because I like to talk about the whole. So what we've summarized in the last three slides is that there are countless dietary lifestyle factors. I really mean countless. I don't know how many, hundreds of thousands of things and foods that might be operating in this sort of system who operate then between, you know, through countless biological mechanisms, and again, unlimited, really, to produce countless health and disease endpoints. The same thing, it's a, it's a common formula, it's a common message, essentially, that's operating in this way. And it's the, we have to acknowledge the fact it's very complex as far as the biochemistry is concerned. And it's a mistake to focus on one, just one little bit of it at a time not being aware of the whole. But the whole is much greater than the sum of its parts. It, it is indeed impressive. In fact, the converse of that is reductionism, as I call it, which is fundamental to the way we do the research. It's fundamental to the way we have actually practiced our medicine. I call it when it's called naked reductionism. In other words, look at things in isolation. Single chemicals doing single things by single mechanisms is trouble. We're asking for trouble when we do it that way especially when you consider the question of diet. Now, and that's where a lot of confusion arises in the public about nutrition. People tend to want to think, what does this nutrient do? What does that one do? And how does it work? That's not the way nutrition works. We've got to consider it, you know, in the context of whole foods. So I say if there's an evil force in biomedical research, it is, in fact, naked reductionism. I'm working on a second book right now to sort of elaborate this, this point, but I, I think it's a very important point because it's fundamental. It's the way we in a profession think wrongly, as well as the way the public thinks wrongly about what really creates health. Uh, now I'm going to share you just the consequences of, of that wrongful thinking. I'm going to go back and just choose an example that you may have heard about. This is a comparison, for example, that was published in the 1970s by my good friend, my late friend, Ken Carroll, and some others, uh, showing the relationship between total fat intake and breast cancer. Similarly, it was shown for colon cancer, heart disease. If you compare different countries, you can see a really impressive relationship. The higher the fat intake, the higher the breast cancer rates. That slide, this thing was shown probably more than any other slide in medicine almost for many years. That, this particular observation here is what led to the idea for the public to think about cutting down fat intake, and specifically cutting down saturated fat intake. That was a, not a good message. Good idea to cut down fat, yes. But that wasn't the end of the story. There's far more to it than that. Show this nice relation. It looked like there's something more here. So I went back and actually took Ken's data and looked at it a little more carefully. Turns out if you draw a line, if you look at that sort of in a theoretical sense, it shows, it suggests that at least there's a threshold. And this constant threshold, again, is important. In other words, if we can consume up to a certain amount of fat in a diet and in theory not expect to get breast cancer. I say in theory. Uh, and of course we know, we need some fat in our diet, no question about it. The fat is normally present, let's say, in plant-based foods. So that's, that's the relationship that was shown there. But then Ken had some data too, 
that wasn't, didn't get much attention. If you look at the relationship between plant fat intake and breast cancer, you see no relationship. You look at animal fat intake and the relationship returns. And here the threshold is zero. In other words, it's sort of suggesting if we look at it from a theoretical point of view, it sort of says putting any fat, animal fat, or any fat from animal foods in the diet is going to tend to increase breast cancer risk. So we see this dichotomy emerging again, plant fat versus animal fat. This, wasn't, this part of the story wasn't told as far as his data were concerned. But it turns out that it's not just fat. It can be animal protein because the correlation between total fat and animal protein is almost perfect, 94%, as you can see there. And so we could say, okay, that's animal protein intake. We ought not to consume any animal protein because in theory, you know, the breast cancer rates, colon cancer rates, heart disease rates, and other kinds of diseases that go together can start to increase. So it's not just protein also, by the way, it's animal food. It's animal food. So that original chart that was shown really should have been animal food. So we have evidence showing that dietary fat alone is not the cause of breast cancer. Right, this is what I'm just elaborating here, this particular example. And lots of other evidence too for the same point of view. But I wanted to show this because this is what had been commonly discussed over the years. We, so one kind of evidence is what I just showed, association of animal protein with total fat in Ken Carroll's international study. In other words, it can be animal protein as well as animal fat, and I would argue, in fact, it's probably much more significant. There's another example, again, a popular one that many of you have heard about. I think most of you know about the nurse's health study. How many have heard about the nurse's health study? You've heard of that, and it's the study done at Harvard, now costing something like $150 million on a group of about 90,000, 100,000 nurses or so. There's evidence in that study too, although the investigators don't particularly want to admit it to quite this way, but there's strong evidence in there too to illustrate the same point I'm going to make. And it's a point that led to a lot of confusion. And that's why I'm showing you this because it has to do with this naked reductionism concept. Here is the relationship as the nurses' health study uh, group, investigators, here's the relationship between fat intake and breast cancer after eight years, actually now after 14 years, um, you can see those dotted lines across there. You go from, let's say, something pretty high fat diets like 49% of calories. That's a pretty fatty diet. Down to something less than 30%, 29% or so. And as, as people, as women decrease their fat intake from around 50% to 25% or something like that, breast cancer doesn't go down. And here's, here's, what, here's what people did. They took the Ken Carroll study, or the scientists did this and told the public about it, they started taking out fat out of the diet, and how did they do it? They started using low-fat milk. They started using skim milk. They started using low, low lean cuts of meat and things like that, in the hope that by decreasing fat alone, they would decrease breast cancer risk. Doesn't work. It doesn't work. And it won't work for heart disease either. And this is basically what was shown here, because that's what these women were doing. They didn't change their ratio. What they did not do, they didn't change their ratio for animal to plant-based food. So they didn't do. In fact, these, these women and these nurses in this particular study were virtual carnivores. They consumed... I mean, that's what they were told to do. Or that's what they led to believe. That's what we did. That's what I did. You know, because by using lean cut skim milk, they're jumping from the fry frying pan into the fire because they're taking out the fat and the protein content actually goes up. So in this particular study here, for example, the lower the fat intake, the higher the protein intake. And the protein intake was already high in the beginning. 81% of the total protein in these women, 81% was from animal-based foods, large from dairy. So now we're getting evidence. You can guess that dairy is related to breast cancer strongly related to breast cancer. Just this is one thing. So that we did that, so that study has moved along. I, I'm quite critical of that kind of study because all the women in that study were doing everything wrong. And they changed their fat intake, yeah, but that didn't make a whole lot of difference, as you can see. Uh, there, there are other studies, unfortunately, many of the human studies that we have done over the years. Basically, we use a cohort of people who are consuming diets in the wrong way. We don't, really, we don't have anybody in the study who really should be doing things the right way. So how can we learn? We get a lot of confusion results, the public gets confused and all the rest of it. 
The Women's Health Initiative Feasibility Study, that's a big one. That had three arms to that study. About 40 hospitals in the country are involved. Many of you may have heard of it. Uh, it's something similar to the nurses' cells, not exactly, but it's similar. And so they were also focused on if you get the fat out of the diet, you're going to get some good things out of this. They spent more than a billion dollars now so far doing that study. And the results are the same thing. And so when the results came out that fat has no relationship to breast cancer, featured in the front page of the New York Times headlines, everybody gets confused. Oh my gosh, they say, you know, fat's not really... In other words, the whole dietary hypothesis begins to fall apart because of this mischief, of this wrong conclusion. It's really about whole food, it's not about fat. And so I just wanted to show that that's what happens when we think when we use naked reductionism doing research and then telling the public about it. And there's lots and lots of other examples. There's beta carotene trials. In other words, foods that are high in beta carotene, vegetables and so forth and so on, are associated with lower cancer risk, right? So what did researchers do? They pulled out the beta carotene, put it in a little pill, and gave it to some people and see what it would do. And what did it do? It increased, increased cancer risk, didn't decrease it. Nutrient supplements don't work. Not in the long term. They simply don't work. That's naked reductionism. Chemical carcinogen testing is another fantastic example. We tend to conclude that single chemicals cause cancer. And we forget. We just forget about all this second stage of promotion, sort of controlling whether or not it occurs. Anyhow, this is something very fundamental, really has to do with Western medicine, the fact that we tend to rely on single chemicals, usually drugs, to try to achieve something good in the long term. And at best, what we tend to do is patch over things, I think, at least compared to diet. Diet is, is far more significant. And let's get to the China study quickly. Uh, eventually, I had an opportunity with colleagues from China and colleagues from the University of Oxford and elsewhere to organize a study in China to go there in the early 1980s, right after our two countries started to talk to each other, to go there to see why it was in China that cancer was so common in some counties and not in others. This is a, a, an atlas here for breast cancer. You can, without seeing all the detail in that, their breast cancer is mu much lower in China overall than here. But actually, nonetheless, there were differences between high-rate regions and low-rate regions. So we wanted to go there, and I wanted to put into play this idea of measuring a whole lot of different things to see, look at patterns, and see, in fact, you know, what might come out of that kind of study. So we had about four dozen different kinds of diseases to consider. We collected all kinds of information you can see there. Uh, it, it was a very elaborate study, to be honest about it. We ended up with 367 items of information, or variables, as we call them about four dozen different kinds of disease. We measured things in the blood and the urine and food and analyzed them. About two dozen different laboratories around the world got involved in working with us on this. And so we had this chance to get into the data and ended up with a huge volume of data that we could begin to look for patterns. And we started, our, started looking at little details of that big pattern of stuff. And here's some here. This has all been published. Breast cancer versus fat, estrogen versus breast cancer, age of manic breast, I mean, on and on and on. What came out of these detailed analyses of the bits parts was basically the same thing. The closer we get to a plant-based diet, whole foods plant-based diet, not the nutrient supplements, whole food plant-based diets, the closer we get to that, the greater is going to be the health outcome, and the less is going to become the disease. And I should say, a low Fat, I mean, let me go to the next thing here. Uh, here. Here's one way we looked at the China data, this huge volume of data. When we look at data this way, we have to use different approaches. We can't look at single little details. So all the, here's a bunch of diseases that we had data on in China. And I just simply wanted to see if, in fact, there was any aggregation of similar kinds of diseases in the same area. And you can see two lists here, so-called poverty diseases and also affluent diseases. All the diseases in any one list is correlated with diseases in its own list, and inversely correlated with diseases in the opposite list. So in other words, the diseases on the right are diseases that tend to get us in Western countries, industrialized countries. The diseases on the left tend to get poor countries. So this suggests there's some common, maybe some common causes. I wanted to know what were the common causes, let's say, of affluent diseases, and we measured a bunch of stuff. And it turns out that as cholesterol goes up in the blood, these diseases start to appear. And this was really interesting because cholesterol in China, in rural China, the range of cholesterol goes from 90 to 170. The average is 127. Their high is near our low. 
and are consuming mostly plant-based diet. So as these people increase their cholesterol levels, they increase it as they start putting in even small amounts of animal food. I found that surprising because I didn't think we'd see that. As soon as small amounts of animal food start to be put into the diets of these, as they get more money and they can buy a, a side of beef or whatever, as they start consuming more and more of this animal food, their cholesterol is large levels start to go up and that in turn associated with all these Western diseases. Just an indicator, cholesterol is not the cause, it's an indicator. It's a whole bunch of stuff that starts going wrong at the same time. And here's just basically the total cholesterol and the bad cholesterol, HDL, you can see the correlation for those of you who are interested. You can see the highly significant associations. Animal protein is associated with increasing levels of total cholesterol and bad cholesterol. And plant protein, as an indication of plant-based foods, of course, is inversely correlated. So, in other words, it, it, it sort of affirms essentially what we were doing both in the laboratory and, and other human studies. So here's the big grand sort of conclusion in a way. For minimal disease risk, this is from the China study. Virtually all of the observed associations favor the nutrient composition of a whole foods plant-based diet. As I say, what made this particularly intriguing in China if we go back and take those data that Ken Carroll had in the beginning, looking at breast cancer for different countries in the world, and I marked it off here. Western studies are all done at the top right quadrant. We're all consuming the wrong stuff. We do studies and we get confused and we tell it to the public and the public gets confused and you know, we change little things here and there. Just trivial changes aren't going to make much difference. But then in the lower left-hand quadrant, no studies have been done down there. That's where the China study was. And what we basically showed is that we start putting in reasonably small amounts of animal-based foods, and I should add, not at that time, as we start consuming processed foods too. In other words, getting away from whole plant foods, we get that problem. So there's the main idea. Plant-based diets enhance health, prevent, and cure a broad range of diseases. It works throughout the disease process, as I would like to uh, suggest again. There's, there's the diet I'm talking about is whole vegetables, fruits, grains, legumes, nuts, little or no added salt, sugar, fat, processed foods. That's what we need to work toward, and the results can be amazing. And incidentally, this is a high carbohydrate diet. You can see 80% of the energy, this is a high carb diet. You may find that surprising. Carbohydrate basically only comes from plant foods. When you're consuming plant foods, that's a high carb diet. Unfortunately, there are some really mischievous authors that have been out there with no training in nutrition, writing books talking about high-protein, low-carb diets. They were the ones that invented that silly term, carb. I like to think of carbohydrates, but in any case, they confused the public about talking about low-carb diets when they were really talking about refined sugars, white flour, things like this. Fair enough. That kind of carbohydrate is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about whole foods, which incidentally is a high-carbohydrate kind of food. So, this is my final slide. In, in my research career, what, as I look back, I, uh, the thing that, that intrigues me most and convinces me most about this message is to try to work out some principles, principles that can apply across genders, male and female, principles that apply going from one species to another, principles that apply from early stages of disease to the late stage of disease. Principles that apply going, let's say, from pure, good, really good health to ill health. Principles. So I think principles, once we get the principles in our minds, we begin to understand what's going on. And that's what's so impressive. And here's some principles. Health, the health and disease is a continuum. It's not a dichotomy. We don't, for example, in, in cancer, all of a sudden we're free of cancer, and suddenly we go to the doctor, and the doctor says, you've got cancer. No, no, no. It's just been noticed at that time. That's basically what it is because there's a continuum. So the factors working toward that point also work after that point. Multiplicity mechanisms work like a symphony. Our body is a symphony when you think of a nutritional sense. It's beautiful. Dose and response thresholds are very helpful to understand what they are. We can control our genes through nutrition. So what are we doing all this research and getting so concerned about genetic disorders? Plant-based diets keep all these mischievous genes that we have in our system under control. The effect is comprehensive. It applies across the board. And then, since then, I should tell you, I think this is a validation of history. I've really been quite interested in the history of philosophy and the history of science. This idea 
was extant and popular in the 16 and 1700s by the leading authorities of the day. It also was prominent in the 1800s by serious people too, and it got put to sleep about the late 1800s as we got into the industrial age for all sorts of different reasons. So, uh, and, and it, has a, it really does have a very old history. So, and it's been summarized, I said, as I said before, I sat down with my son who was actually a graduate in theater from Cornell University, he was an aspiring actor in Chicago and good writer. I, I, I said he could write better than I could, got him involved, come back, and he got so carried away with this thing who he, he decided to change his career from theater and now he's in medical school. Anyhow, it's in that book if you want to see, you know, how I came up with these weird ideas. Different ideas than what I ever thought I would start in, but I have to tell you, I am enthusiastic for what this can do. And since this book came out, the feedback we're getting at the present time is, is really gratifying. The number of people who are trying this and writing and telling, you can see, on, if you want to look and see, look on Amazon. They write reviews on there. Just look at the reviews that have been sent in. It's really pretty, pretty incredible what this kind of approach can do, you know, to actually create health and prevent disease. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I did. I've listened to thousands of hours of doctors talking about health. I have put my favorite talks on my website, www.tedshealthclub.com, under the educational videos tab, I hope you will use this resource as a tool to improve your health. Meet me back here the first Wednesday of every month. Next month will be August 4th and we're going to be hearing from another doctor why it's healthier to not eat animal products. Look for opportunities where you can substitute for animal products. When I go to Chipotle, I order a brown rice bowl, I get black beans, fajita vegetables, salsa, and guacamole. I don't get meat, sour cream, or cheese. I'm still very satisfied with my meal, and I know it's the healthier choice. Have a great month.